Okay, hello. Uh, hello everyone and also hello to the YouTube assembly I think is uh, right here. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm Morgan Schreiber and I'm from uh, Ubisoft Editorial User Research Lab uh, in Paris, so 100% French and I apologize in advance for my uh, potential English mistakes. Uh, for the past two years, I worked uh, on Ghost Recon Islands as the lead user researcher. Uh, and what I want to present to you today uh, is a story. <laughs> Sorry, a bit too loud. Uh, is a story of uh, how, together with my colleagues, we built uh, the user research process on this game. So let's take, let's look back uh, on the past with the very first mission we had. Uh, which was uh, building our user research process in this game and uh, to help the development team improve the user experience uh, of Ghost Recon. So, firstly, uh, we focused on usability and uh, tried to know uh, how to improve the usability of our game, but we quickly uh, noticed that it was uh, not enough uh, to know how to improve the game because uh, everyone knows that uh, even if we uh, improve the usability of a game, it didn't mean that uh, the game would be good. But also, uh, let's take the example of uh, the menus from The Witcher 3. Uh, we can find uh, numerous uh, complaints about the user interface uh, of this game. Uh, but, uh, so, it had a bad usability, uh, but had uh, and received a good reception at the end. So. Apparently, usability was not enough and since something was missing at this point. So, we wondered how to ensure a good, re uh, good uh, reception of our games. So, uh, we started to uh, focus on uh, game appreciation at large. And uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, games such as uh, GT5, <coughs> Zelda Breath of the Wild, or uh, Metal Gear Solid. Uh, they all received a good appreciation and a good reception at the end. And uh, we could focus uh, on this element, but uh, these are just scores, and uh, a score by itself is not a clear, as not clear actionable, because you can see, okay, uh, my game scores uh, well or not, but it's difficult to know uh, why. Also, uh, when you are talking uh, with a player about uh, what you loved, uh, about the game, they often struggle uh, to explain and conceptualize what, uh, what was good or what was not. And we often end up uh, with uh, the same comments from uh, any games, such as, okay, the world is beautiful, and that's it. So it was even more uh, difficult for us as games are becoming uh, more and more uh, complex with plenty of systems that are interacting with each other. So it was also difficult for the players to uh, just under understand uh, what was wrong or what was not, and could tell about uh, something, but it was actually uh, the impact of another system. So we are limited at this point. You could say, okay, but you just have to go through each system of your game and check if they were good or not. And it's uh, actually what we did at this point. And uh, this allowed us to have uh, <coughs> numerous feedback, plenty of feedback, so it was really good. We have uh, plenty of food, uh, but what was difficult uh, was to know uh, which was the priority amongst all of this feedback, and uh, to know which uh, good or bad feedback would have the best uh, impact on the game. So, it was also difficult for us because we have uh, we had numerous feedback, but not enough time to go deeper, uh, both on the user research side to know uh, what was good, was, uh, what was not, what was not good, and why. But also uh, regarding the development team, because uh, you can find and know uh, 100 uh, problems on our work, on your game, but you just have time to uh, fix, I don't know, uh, 10. So, how can you prioritize at this point? And uh, the other limitation we had about uh, just focusing on appreciation uh, was that we had uh, the instant appreciation of our players, uh, but we missed uh, the long-term prediction of uh, would uh, our players uh, would be engaged in our game in the long term. 
and it was uh, especially a uh, huge focus for us uh, because games such as uh, Ghost Recon uh, want to engage players in the long term for um, 10 to uh, 100 hours. So, something, something is still uh, definitely missing at this point. And uh, what we wondered at this point was uh, what matters the most in the long term uh, for players. And to do so, uh, we started uh, focusing on the notion of engagement and players' motivation. So, uh, does this mean that we uh, just forget and uh, stopped uh, working on usability and appreciation? Uh, not at all. Uh, actually, uh, we uh, drive our uh, priorities uh, based on notion of engagement and used all of the tools we had uh, for usability and appreciation uh, that were, that were uh, described in uh, other presentations, such as telemetry, interviews, observations, etc., and uh, put them at the service of the notion of engagement. So, what is engagement? This is a question we asked at this point, and uh, a, team from, a team of my colleagues uh, from France, Sweden, and Canada uh, at Ubisoft uh, worked on uh, this uh, kind of theories and uh, dig into uh, plenty of uh, theories talking about motivation and engagement of persons and ended up uh, with the self-determination theory uh, from uh, Desi and Ryan. So you could ask uh, why we choose this one. Uh, it was pretty simple. It was just because uh, this theory used uh, intuitive vocabulary that was, uh, and that is easy to understand even for a person that, has, that didn't have a psychology degree, but also because it was already known within the video game industry. So we can talk about something that could, be, uh, that could mean uh, something with game designers. So, this team, uh, this research team worked on uh, creating a model uh, of uh, video games uh, using the model of the self-determination theory that I will present you a bit uh, later. And also uh, from this model uh, created a questionnaire to assess uh, each of the elements of uh, this theory and that I will uh, present you a bit again just after. And uh, what we did actually uh, as individuals was to uh, apply uh, this method, uh, so this model and these questionnaires, uh, to uh, the game of Ghost Recon. So, first mission uh, completed. Uh, we knew uh, which uh, process we could use, but uh, at this point, uh, what I personally wondered, and what I think uh, most of you could wonder too, is uh, what, uh, self, what is self-determination theory. So, it will be, uh, and it was, uh, the next mission. So, let's take an example, uh, a quick example. So, uh, I apologize in advance for people uh, who knows uh, very, very uh, well the theory, because I will just take some uh, shortcuts, to be clear and uh, quick enough. So, let's take uh, these three players uh, exploring the world of Ghost Recon. And uh, what we can see uh, using telemetry is that, okay, three players are exploring. Cool. But uh, what we wondered at this point was, uh, cool, but uh, which one uh, is the most motivated uh, in this activity and would uh, explore the longest? So, to do so, uh, and based on the theory, uh, we go uh, deeper on each player motivation. So take a, let's take a look at each. So our first player uh, explored because he had to explore to complete uh, the mission he was currently playing. So uh, what the theory uh, can uh, learn to you is that is uh, determined as an extrinsic motivation because uh, this is something uh, external to the player that uh, motivate the player to complete uh, the activity. So here it was the mission asking him to do so. So it would be engaged, but uh, on the mission will be uh, end, uh, would be complete. Uh, these players would stop exploring uh, the world. The second one uh, needed to explore the world to find uh, new skill points. 
So this one, you could say, okay, this was not a mission or anything else. It was something that uh, motivates him and he just uh, put his own goal. But again, we could talk about extrinsic motivation because he did it uh, just because he wanted something else, uh, which was uh, skill points, and to uh, gather skill points he needed to explore. So again, it would be a bit more engaged, but uh, stop uh, exploring the, the world after a time. And the third one uh, tells us that uh, he wanted to explore the world uh, just to discover it and uh, find new adventures. So this one uh, adds an intrinsic motivation because it just uh, did uh, the activity for the purpose of doing it. So this one, uh, based on the theory, would be the one the most engaged in the long term. So to uh, summarize a bit, uh, the self-determination uh, could help us uh, focus on being intrinsically motivated to play. <coughs> This theory was applied uh, in many, many uh, domains uh, before uh, video games, such as uh, education, leisure, uh, health and work, and uh, really recently on video games. This theory uh, talks about psychological needs and uh, how we can uh, fulfill these needs of uh, motivation. And uh, the theory splits this on uh, three parts. Uh, the first one is the need of relatedness. The second one is the need of competence, and uh, the last is the need of autonomy. So, could be still a bit obscure uh, at this point, so let's take a look at each one individually. So, to start with relatedness, uh, we can uh, summarize it as a desire to feel connected to each other, and uh, go back to the research team I talked uh, a bit later, a bit earlier. Uh, we wanted to uh, create a model uh, which was uh, more easy to conceptualize for us, so we split uh, this uh, part in uh, two uh, parts. It's three, but ac actually it's two, uh, which were uh, closeness and interdependence. We just split them uh, for a reason I will just uh, explore a little later. So, uh, closeness uh, is more about feeling close to uh, NPC or players and uh, having the ability to bond with them, while uh, players' interdependence is more about the need to adapt uh, to other players' uh, actions and uh, feeling the impact my actions could have on other players. So, uh, why we split it? Uh, the closeness is just because uh, if we had a game that uh, was not a multiplayer game, we just removed uh, players' interdependence and players' closeness from uh, this component and just <coughs> mainly focused on the NPC closeness. Uh, about competence uh, is more about the desire to feel competent and progress through challenges. Again, we split it uh, in two parts, which, is, uh, which are uh, mastery and growth. So the mastery is mostly about uh, the game showcasing the competence of, of the players and uh, the ability the players have to uh, feel efficient uh, when playing the game. While the growth is more about uh, showcasing the progress of the players through the game and, uh, for instance, uh, offering them uh, increasing challenges. Auth autonomy is more about uh, the desire to self-organize experience and behavior. Uh, a bit tricky, uh, so we split it, it again in two parts. Uh, which are playstyle and agency. So for playstyle, I think I will uh, don't uh, learn you anything here, but it's more about uh, offering varied uh, styles uh, within the game and uh, be sure that uh, all these styles are supported by the game. And agency is more about uh, having uh, a variety of choices within the game and that these choices are meaningful. And uh, when I ju just takes a decision to take a choice uh, or another, uh, be sure that uh, these choices has, uh, have an impact on the game. So, to summarize and to uh, show you a bit of uh, the entire model is uh, right here. So, <coughs> cool. At this point, uh, we uh, understood uh, the self-determination theory and uh, we were able to uh, know uh, which were uh, behind uh, terms like uh, autonomy or agency. 
but uh, we still wondered at this point how we could apply this theory to a game such as Ghost Recon and how to define uh, this game through this model. So it was our next mission, uh, a bit of mental gymnastics uh, about defining Ghost Recon through the lens of the self-determination theory. So first step, uh, we needed to uh, list all of the systems and features of our games to know uh, from what our, for what, uh, our game is composed. To do so, oh, and I'm sorry for the lines, uh, we listed everything, such as uh, the teammates, the characters, me, the missions, etc., etc. And for each one, uh, we went uh, deeper on how they could answer each of the needs uh, described by the theory. So let's take a look. Who? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> let's take a look uh, at the world as an example. So uh, when we took uh, the example of the playstyle, uh, we wanted our world uh, to offer environments supporting a variety of tactics. We wanted also uh, to offer players a gradual difficulty between regions of our world, and uh, also uh, that our world uh, has a strong identity with uh, interesting citizens, animals, uh, memorable land landmarks, etc., etc. Then, uh, we, from these uh, information, uh, we created uh, the Ghost Recon uh, self-determination model. So we took back uh, the model we had at the beginning, and uh, behind each of the facets, we put each of the systems or features that could answer each of the needs. So for instance, at this point, uh, when talking with the team about agency, we didn't really talk about agency, but more about weapons, character smiths, recon, story, etc., etc. Again, uh, for the ones of you uh, who have uh, very good eyes, you could uh, notice that the same system could be found uh, <coughs> below uh, several uh, subfacets, and it's uh, actually the points uh, we wanted to achieve uh, because uh, the most your main the your main systems answers uh, each of the facets of the SDT, uh, the most you could ensure a good uh, engagement in the systems. So for instance, weapons. Again, uh, be below the playstyle, we wanted our weapons to support our four identified playstyles. We wanted them also to allow players to feel better at shooting with time, and to allow players in cooperation to build varied tactics. And uh, the next step uh, was about defining, defining our goals, because we could have the model of our game, uh, but it was difficult for us to know uh, if we were good or not uh, without having uh, specific goals and specific uh, games as uh, competitors. So to do so, uh, we listed uh, our game intentions, which were the freedom of choices, the variety of play style, and uh, offering an enriching cooperation. And this helped us uh, defining two things. Uh, first, uh, the facets which were uh, the most uh, important for us. So uh, freedom of choices is more about uh, the need of agency. The variety of playstyle, obviously the need of playstyle. And the enri enriching cooperation could uh, be answered with the player's closeness and interdependence. So this didn't mean that uh, we will just uh, forget all of the other facets, but just uh, if we needed to prioritize at some point uh, which of the facets we wanted to be uh, the best, uh, we just focus on this one. This also allowed us to uh, spot our main competitors, so the games that were uh, known to be good uh, in uh, freedom of choices, variety of play styles, and enriching cooperation. So, cool, uh, we managed to define our game uh, through the lens of SDT, uh, but we still wondered at this point uh, how to know if we were good or not, and uh, it's pretty much the faces we had at this point, uh, because we wondered how to do that, and uh, to do so, uh, we went through uh, our uh, last but not the least mission, which was assessing the game through the lens of SDT. So to do so, uh, we use a questionnaire uh, built by our 
internal user research uh, team uh, that created uh, this, a self-determination theory questionnaire, sorry. And uh, I can't uh, share it with you uh, for confidentiality purpose, and I'm uh, sorry about that. <laughs> But I will just uh, talk a bit about uh, what this questionnaire is and when we used it. So it's a universal tool that could be used uh, on any games. Uh, it, composed, it is composed of uh, 21 questions. And if you are uh, good in mathematics and if you have a good memory, uh, you could uh, notice that uh, it means that we add three questions per subfacet. Uh, and this allowed us to uh, cover the entire game and each SDT uh, subfacet. When uh, did we use it? Uh, firstly, on our benchmark games, our competitors, uh, just to know how they scored uh, regarding uh, the scales we had. Then on Ghost Recon Wildland, uh, and it was all along development, and during user tests and live tests also. So, first step was uh, assessing our goals. To do so, uh, we conducted uh, user tests with uh, our competitors' games and uh, give players a questionnaire to uh, fulfill and see uh, how uh, each game could uh, rate at each uh, subfacet. <coughs> so, let's take a look at these results. So, uh, there are plenty of statistical stuff uh, behind this, but I don't have time to go through this. Uh, let's keep in mind that it was mainly about uh, either gathering uh, the mean of the best games or taking one game as our uh, main benchmark. And uh, let's also uh, keep in mind that all the confidence interval stuff are taken into account uh, in the results I will show you. So, after assessing our goals, we needed uh, to tell, take the pulse of our game, and to do so, we went through our first type of uh, user tests, uh, which were micro tests, macro tests, sorry, uh, where we let players uh, play the game uh, how they wanted to, and at the end, we uh, gave them uh, the self-determination theory questionnaire, and some uh, more questions about each system of the game to just know how this code and what players appreciated or not. <coughs> so, really, uh, these are results uh, really early in the development phase before the beta, the beta phase. And uh, what we can notice is, uh, firstly, uh, that we uh, already matched uh, our goals in uh, players' closeness, players' interdependence, uh, mastery and growth. So, uh, so at this point, we could just uh, put these uh, facets uh, away for a while and uh, focusing on the facets where uh, we were not uh, satisfied enough. So we had um, NPC closeness, playstyle, and agency right here. And uh, to, do, uh, to know uh, from these three facets uh, on which uh, we would focus on first, we took back uh, our design intentions uh, to know uh, which would be our priorities. So uh, let's remember about the freedom of choice. So okay, agency will be uh, one of my main focus. A variety of playstyles. So okay, playstyle will also be uh, one of our priorities. However, uh, regarding NPC closeness, we didn't have uh, any main design intention. So again, this didn't mean that we didn't care about this, but just it would not be our focus uh, right now. So at this point, we needed uh, to elaborate hypotheses to understand why we were not uh, satisfying players uh, regarding these aspects and uh, testing to know uh, how players behaved uh, regarding that and give a more uh, impactful uh, feedback to the team. So we, br we brought back uh, our model of the SDT with our game, uh, with playstyle and agency, to see uh, which uh, systems were behind uh, each of these terms. And together with the development team, uh, we did workshops to understand 
thanks to uh, the team, uh, the team insights, but also uh, thanks to the questionnaire we add with the systems, uh, the list of systems, to uh, pinpoint which of these systems could uh, explain a bad satisfaction about these topics. So for Playstyle, we focused on combat teammates and world. And for agency, we focused on factions, skills, and missions. Then we conducted uh, micro-tests, which were our uh, second uh, type of test. So we conducted a micro-test with Playstyle and micro-test with agency, uh, trying to uh, find uh, actionable uh, without, uh, within these uh, topics. So for instance, uh, we focused on the stealth style and wondering uh, as user research questions, uh, is it, uh, was it supported by the game? And if not, why? Then uh, about the controls players had on their teammates, their EA teammates, because in the game you have uh, three teammates uh, following you everywhere. And uh, again about uh, the clarity of our detection rules because players were a bit complaining about this and had confusions. And uh, regarding agency, we uh, mostly focused on uh, the progression uh, players could uh, notice uh, on the factions because in the game when you are doing an action uh, that is related or a mission that is related to a faction, you could uh, have an impact on this faction, and maybe the impact was not uh, clear enough for players, or maybe it was not sufficient as an impact. Uh, we also uh, went through a missions impact, because you are, in the game you have uh, plenty of regions, and in each region you have a leader, and for, uh, you have to uh, kill or uh, corrupt uh, each leader, and to do so you have plenty of uh, missions to complete and you have uh, a difference between the impact you can have on the drug cartel, because it's a drug cartel for people not knowing the game, and, uh, and actually the <coughs> missions you had to do to uh, go to this leader. And uh, another topic we could have was about the skills in the game, and uh, be sure that players had uh, sufficient choices, and uh, when players are unlocking skills, uh, do they feel that uh, they have an impact or not in the game? And uh, the results from these uh, micro-tests allowed us to uh, share uh, actionable feedback to the team, allowing them to uh, tweak the design of the game. And then, once the design was tweaked, we took the pulse uh, of the game again to see uh, how we scored regarding uh, our model of CSDT. Uh, then when we had uh, facets that were not uh, satisfying enough uh, for players, we continued uh, elaborating and testing uh, hypotheses, then tweaking our design again and again and again and again. And I uh, really would love to present you uh, each of these results, but we had uh, around uh, uh, 30 tests, and I would not just have uh, time uh, to present you. So, you could say it's a cool story, uh, but did it work at the end? And uh, it was actually uh, one of my uh, greatest fears at this point. So, what happened at the end? Let's take a look. So. Let's look back at uh, the results we had early in the development, before the beta phase, and how we scored at the end. So we conducted um, a test uh, with the release version of the game. And so for Playstyle, yoo-hoo, we matched our goal, so we were really happy. For the agency, we didn't match our goal, but we really, really increased the satisfaction of our players, so we were really happy. And uh, for the NPC closeness, that uh, was not our, our main focus, that, as I said earlier. Uh, so actually, uh, we also improved it. Uh, it was not uh, so strange, actually, because uh, when you look at the game, uh, the agency the players can have in the game, so the choices you have, the impact you can have of your actions, uh, could be intrinsically uh, linked to the characters uh, within the game. So, not so surprising, but we were really happy. Uh, 
but actually, uh, the end is not the end because after the release of the game, uh, we continued uh, during the post-launch to uh, analyze uh, different aspects of the game and trying uh, to improve uh, the user experience. Uh, but uh, this is uh, another mission, uh, maybe for another submit. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, let me know if you have questions. Uh, really interesting talk. Uh, I have two very quick, very quick questions. So the first one is, at one point you exposed the needs, you talked about the needs. Uh, who is responsible for defining those? Producers, designers, researchers? Uh, when I talk about the needs, I uh, mainly talked about psychological needs explained by the theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we did actually, and um, uh, you raised a good point, because uh, when we started working on the self-determination theory, you could see that uh, we went through different uh, user research things. So we started to work on this uh, after the conception fails. So uh, we were not able to uh, build things with the team at this point. So we mainly uh, focused on uh, planning the model. And uh, for instance, each question and each need we wanted was, well, for instance, uh, the example of the world and. Uh, offering increasing uh, challenges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, yes. thank you very much. Uh, so the second question is: uh, when you showed the, the chart uh, fulfilling the goals that you set, uh, at one point you reduced like from eight features to three that weren't fulfilled uh, yeah. in the questionnaire. Do you, at any point, reevaluate those that have been met already? Yeah, actually, at each uh, pulse, at each macro test we did, we took back uh, okay. the methods and the model and see uh, re regarding what uh, players could uh, tell us which would be uh, our next. But actually, even with micro test, we could know that, uh, and I think I will not uh, learn you anything, but uh, the team didn't have always time to uh, correct each of the things uh, before a next uh, sprint, so mm -hmm. we also had some Thank you. Hi, uh, quick question. At what stage of development did you start this process? Sorry, I didn't understand. At what stage of the development process did you kick this off? Okay, uh, we started uh, just before the beta phase uh, at this point because we just started the, the process because this was, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but this was a pilot uh, study. We didn't uh, try this process at all before and we came at uh, just before the beta phase. Uh, but what I would want to do uh, is to uh, try new methods to do that uh, during the conception or just, uh, just before. Uh, hi, Morgan. Um, uh, the, at the start of the talk, you had three reference games, which had quite high Metacritic mm -hmm. scores of 97, 97, 95. But the Metacritic for Wildlands is 70, which is a massive difference. Yeah. So despite all the research and the cool story, which is pretty cool, by the way, um, <laughs> why the massive difference in Metacritic? So Sorry. What? Why the massive difference in Metacritic compared to this? to the reference games that you had? Good question. Uh, I would uh, just avoid this question about uh, talking not about Metacritics, but focusing more about how engaged players were in the long term. And I just can't share your results, but we had a really long term engagement with most of our players. So this was our main uh, focus at this point. And I would love to have a better Metacritic, and it would be the next step, but uh, yeah. Hello. Um, I, I've got a question about the... Uh, let's try that again. Uh, how, how easy was it for your players, for your users, to be able to compare three or you know, however many finished products against the early versions of your game, which were very clear, or I'm assuming very clearly unfinished and incomplete, and so therefore how did they know 
what they could compare and what they couldn't. Okay. Uh, it was really easy because we didn't ask them to compare them. Uh, we just add players, uh, sufficient players to have a good database uh, when doing our benchmark tests with our competitors and add our, uh, <coughs> our goals, our scrolls we wanted, and then add uh, other players uh, trying to play the game and most, uh, mostly focusing on the facets and how we wanted, so the competitors were just the goals we wanted to achieve because uh, this uh, questionnaire is uh, with a five scale, uh, but uh, the goal is not to go to five for each facet because it's not realistic uh, and what we uh, notice that it, uh, games are really good at scoring in mastery and growth because it's the essence of a game with challenge, etc. And it was a huge focus for a while, so it's not surprising. But things such as uh, NPC relatedness or uh, agency is more uh, a new focus. And so most of the games from the competitions, uh, except one you could, uh, you could uh, guess, uh, most of them were uh, much lower than five. So it's the games, the competitors were mainly used to put our goals than to compare uh, each of the system with players that, uh, as you say, are not uh, game designers, and it's difficult for them to explain what is good or not from some things. Hi. Um, fascinating, uh, amazing, large piece of work. Um, and are, are, if you're going to write it up somewhere, um, I'd be interested to hear about that. But the I've got an analogy to like biodynamic wine, right? <laughs> that there's a debate in my wine club, like is it because of the biodynamic theory or is it because you're out there in the vineyard kind of taking care of and looking at and measuring and attending to it? So I'm curious to see what you think, like if you step back from this and say, is this because of self-determination theory? Or if you had some other framework and you just like really worked and paid attention and did a lot of stuff, could you achieve a, a similar result? Or do you have any it's thoughts a, on that? It's a really good question, actually. Uh, <coughs> we started with this theory. And uh, I think the, uh, the good point here would be to just uh, have another study with another game to see that uh, before concluding on uh, maybe, um, I'm sure, it could uh, be somewhere a theory, a theory or a model that could help us uh, doing this. It's just what we, we wanted to try this time. <laughs> Hi, Morgan. Uh, yep. Thanks, great, great talk. Um, do you have uh, more specific examples of like um, changes you were able to make in the game to, to increase the scores for the facets? And maybe not only the three, but also maybe how, yeah. how changes impacted the other uh, Okay, It's aspects. a bit touchy for me. And again, I'm sorry, but it's a bit confidential. But I think I can share one of, uh, one of the things I was uh, really happy uh, about was, uh, I don't know which of you has played the game. Mm, OK. Uh, so I will have just to explain a bit. Uh, so as I said, in the game you have to uh, dismantle a drug cartel in Bolivia. And you have uh, the big chief. And it's actually exactly the same as the model of the SDT. You have the big chief at the middle and uh, other leaders uh, just uh, after him. And uh, below the leaders you have a sub-leader. So it's exactly the same model as uh, the SDT. Uh, and uh, to do so, uh, to achieve the end of the game, you have to uh, go through the different, uh, different sub-chief. Uh, but uh, the world is not built uh, as you start at a point in a region uh, with one of these chiefs. And uh, if you go to the next region on the right, you could uh, go through another uh, big chief. And to achieve the goal, uh, the game, uh, you needed, it's really hard to explain like this, but sorry, uh, you needed to uh, kill or uh, corrupt uh, two of the four chiefs. And to do so, you, players needed to know how to uh, consume the game. 
and which regions they could focus on. And uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, we had uh, a menu in the game uh, showcasing the cartel, uh, which, mean, uh, which was named the Cartel Overview. And uh, it was uh, really uh, difficult for players to access it because you had uh, to uh, unzoom uh, the map. When you were on the map, you had to zoom back and then uh, press uh, the zoom button again to display it. So it was uh, most of the time uh, um, a complete random uh, when players uh, go through this. And again, it was early in the development, so uh, we also uh, had things to improve at this point. And uh, players had difficulties to uh, know what they would have to do in the game, and instead of building strategies about the cartel, uh, they just uh, went through a region to another uh, by proximity or by difficulty and, water, and wondered at a point, uh, okay, but how can I achieve and how can I reach the end of the game? And uh, we were able to spot that, which is a bit confusing and uh, not really clear for us to spot, uh, just because we focused on the notion of agency and the choices the players had, the impact they could have, and the decisions they took on the game. And thanks to that, we could manage to find that uh, this uh, panel was not uh, easy enough to find for players. And so we did uh, tweaks in the game that you could find uh, if you play it again to allow players to uh, see this menu, uh, build their strategy, and uh, be happy. Sorry. I don't know if it answers the question. Okay. One more question here. Uh, uh, first of all, excellent presentation, Morgan. It was <laughs> really, really, really good. Uh, my question is about uh, setting the, the goal scores. Uh, I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about the process that you went through to said that the goal is a three or four or a five. Okay, uh, so uh, as I said a bit earlier, uh, we conducted user tests on our benchmark games, our competitors, and uh, let's uh, give them the questionnaire with the, the same uh, five point scales. <coughs> and uh, we see, uh, we saw how uh, our competitors scored to this, uh, to this facet. And uh, so all of our three competitors didn't, uh, were not all focused on each of the SDT facets, so we picked uh, which competitors were the best at each facet. So sometimes it was just one, so it was the score of the one, and sometimes it was several ones, so we did a, a mean of this, or we just took, for instance, uh, the, low, the lowest and the highest and say, okay, we want first uh, to achieve the lowest and then achieve the highest. I just simplified because I didn't have enough time to explain it, but it was uh, basically like that. Thanks. Thanks. All right, that's just about all we have time for. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you.